Good morning. Good morning, Jeff. Good morning, if you're happy. Good morning, good morning, good morning, good morning. Short night, huh? If you're happy and you know it, say amen. Good to see you here at M1 on this first Sunday of November. And uh, I'm Pastor Jeff, and it's great to see you as we begin this uh uh, Thanksgiving season, but also aren't you glad uh, this morning I was able to come to the sur uh, to church and it was daylight outside. Daylight savings. So, and it's saving, not savings. I saw that in the Farmer's Almanac. They want to clarify that it's not daylight savings. It's daylight saving time. So, turn to someone and, and say, who cares? <laughs> who cares? It was nice to have an extra hour last night. So good to see you. Uh, by way of announcements, only 13 days to go uh, with prayer and fasting. Hang in there. Uh, we're going to finish up on Saturday, November the 20th. Keep praying. Keep fasting. You are making a difference. Next Sunday uh, is Veterans Sunday. And it's, it, we've invited several, several uh, people. Uh, just had a phone call this morning of uh, a local dignitary said that uh, he and his family will be here next Sunday. Uh, we will be presenting memorial roll certificates to families, uh, those who have gone on to their eternal reward. And we'll also be having the veterans tribute at the end of the service. And so if you have a picture of a family member who has served in any of the armed forces for the United States, uh, and you want them to be part of that and you haven't already submitted a picture, if you could get that to me by this Wednesday, we're going to uh, present that. And it's just a special, a uh, very special time to just give tribute to our veterans, especially our M1 church family members. In two weeks, we'll finish up prayer and fasting, and we're going to celebrate with our Thanksgiving dinner on Saturday night, November the 20th at 6 p.m. back in the gymnasium. Uh, Joanne and Fred aren't here this morning. They went to be with... Uh, someone else said uh, a family member uh, but Joanne wanted me to stress that we do need food for the Thanksgiving dinner okay she's organizing it and she said the sign up sheet for people to bring food doesn't have a lot of uh, names on it and so uh, if you would if you're planning on bringing something please uh, the sign up sheet is at the information desk please put down the item you're going to bring and we're gonna have a great celebration 
uh, the next day, Sunday, November the 21st is Thanksgiving Sunday. Pastor Josh is going to be bringing the message. We'll have communion and just kick off a great uh, Thanksgiving week. In three weeks, uh, the fo following Thanksgiving Sunday on uh, Saturday night, November the 27th, and Sunday, November the 28th, uh, Evangelist Jeremiah Bolick is going to be with us. And uh, I believe God has something very special in store for M1 through this time of revival. I believe the Holy Spirit really wants to break through in our midst. And I think Jeremiah and the message that he has from God for us may be the catalyst to just break things wide open here at M1. And so if you uh, will plan on being here, continue to pray for the, the revival service. We do need financial support. The envelopes are at the information desk. But just expect, I'm expecting God to do something incredible. Um, be here. In four and a half weeks, we mentioned it last week, uh, the filming of the movie The Rose Wagon will take place on Thursday night, December the 9th. And uh, uh, the director and photographer and several folks of the movie were here uh, last night uh, kind of prepping for it. Uh, they want everyone to be here at 5 p.m. We do want a full house. And uh, you will have to sign a waiver so that your image can be used in the movie, but also in any promotional uh, things. We want a full house. I believe God could use this to change lives. And so uh, plan on being here. Invite family members and friends. We're going to have a great time with the Rose Wagon. At this time, Brother Josh has an announcement. He's going to share our opening scripture. Jeff, while you're here, stay up here. Okay. Josh, come on up. And Miss Ray, where are you? Are you here? Come here. Come up. One of the things when, when I was asked to, to do what I do here for the church, Jeff gave me a list of things that are expected from me. And one of the very last things it said was, no surprises. You know I don't listen to that. October is Pastor's Appreciation Month, and you as a church have demonstrated to our pastors your appreciation for them, and we want to just simply honor them this morning with a little token of how much we appreciate our pastors. Jeff, for you and your family, Josh, for you, and then one other thing is that Today happens to be a very special lady's birthday, and on behalf of the church, happy birthday. It's also, wait, it's also Fred Stone and Nick Sacker's birthday, so I'm in good company. So isn't that like her to make sure we share with other people, too? Let's give them a round of applause. have a quick announcement. Tonight is youth night at my house. Uh, we usually, it starts at 6 p.m. We have food. We play games. It's a fun time. Uh, we have been diving deeper in the book of Luke, uh, so all youth are invited to that, uh, and so I look forward to seeing everybody there tonight. Uh, let's go ahead and jump into the scripture for today. Psalms 104, it says, Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name. It's an awesome privilege to be in the house of the Lord today. And it's wonderful because if we're thinking about it, I'm sorry. <laughs> I got to be careful because I don't want to start preaching. That's not, not the time of the service for that. But it's a time to be thankful. And, and with Thanksgiving come up, coming up, it's, it's, it hits home even harder that we need to be thankful for all that the Lord has done and what he has brought us from. I know that he's brought several people out of, out of addictions. He's brought people out of near-death experiences or even financial despair. God is an ever-present living God who is there to help us. And I am so thankful that he is present in my life. So as, that, as we have started with that, I want us to go ahead and start. Let's stand up and we're going to sing a great song praising his name, and I want to hear your voices loud and clear. Amen. Thank you, Josh. Uh. 
I come before you today And there's just one thing that I want to say Thank you, Lord Thank you, Lord For all you've given to me For all the blessings that I cannot see Thank you, Lord With a grateful heart, with a song of praise, with an outstretched arm, I'll bless your name. Thank you, Lord. I just want to thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. I just want to thank you. and gave me your life. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. You took my sin and my shame. You took my sickness and healed all my pain. Thank you, Lord. song of praise with an outstretched song I'll bless your name thank you Lord oh, I just want to thank you Lord thank you Lord oh, I just want to thank you Lord oh, thank
story isn't over, if the story isn't good, failure's never the final when the father's in the room. Failure's never the final when the father's in the room.
sang a song a little earlier that said that we were in the Father's house. And one of the parts of that song says, check your shame at the door. And I don't know if you've ever had the opportunity to go to a fancy restaurant or something and when you walk in they have this coat check. And you check your, check your coat there and they gave you a number and then whenever you're ready to leave, you go back and you pick up that coat. Church, when you come into the Father's house, you check your shame at the door, but you don't go back and pick it up. You don't have to, because it's been forgiven through Jesus Christ. And you don't have to fear when you stand in His love. Amen? I just had to do that. I'm sorry. It's not in the script, but... This is really a very special, special time of the year. You see the trees changing color. Weather's changing. We change our clocks. There just are so many different things that are going on that are so very special in our, in our lives this time of year. Something that's going to be very special for you for the next two weeks is that you're not going to have to look at this ugly face. This next Thursday, Nelda and I are going to, um, hopefully, after Rocky's statement, Sunday school, we're going to grab an airplane and we're going to fly down to Tampa, Florida and visit my uncle who on the 17th will be 87 years old. And I haven't had a chance to see him since 19 or since 2012. So we have a chance to be away for a couple of weeks. But it's just going to be a very special time for us and we're hoping that it'll be warmer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm. We left home this morning. Our truck temperature said it was 35. We pulled in out here in the parking lot. It says 33. Now, you're supposed to come go south and get warmer, aren't you? Didn't happen. But even when the weather changes and it gets cold, when we have all of the stuff that's happening around us, church, we still have every reason and every right to be thankful for what God has done for us. You believe that? Amen. I do. I do. Philippians 4 6 tells us this Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and petition with thanksgiving present your request to God 
We're going to get ready to pray in just a moment, and Pastor Josh is going to come and lead us. I'm going to ask you to stand and sing the beautiful, wonderful old song that just says, Give Thanks. Let's stand. came across the story of the Israelites and the exodus from Egypt and, and how ungrateful they were. How blinded they were with their own concerns, with their own wants, 
that they could not see or be thankful for what you had provided for them. Dear Lord, I pray that as a nation, that we stop being like those Israelites, stop complaining about everything, stop being blinded by what we want, but instead be thankful for everything that you have provided for us. Dear Lord, I pray for this church. I pray that when people look at this church, they don't see a, a bunch of grumpy people sitting back on the pew and upset about everything, but instead a joyous bunch of people able to celebrate and praise God's name because they know and are thankful for everything that you have done in their lives, how you have redeemed them from sin, brought them from darkness, set them free from slavery so that they may be free to live their lives in your light and in your glory. So dear Lord, as we are going into this service, or we are, as we are going into this sermon, dear Lord, let us be reminded that we need to be thankful for everything that you have done. And when we are down and we are upset, that we just need to dive deeper in you and say, Lord, you have done so much for me. Let me be thankful. Because that will bring us up from despair. Dear Lord, I pray that you be with each and every one of us here. Be with Jeff as he gives the message. I pray that you anoint him with your spirit. And I pray this in your precious name. Amen. And you may be seated and the children are dismissed at this time. Amen. November is a special time, isn't it? Um, then November 7th is a very special day. Ray's 29th birthday again. Yeah. <laughs> Never forget how many candles you get. And I think it's someone's anniversary. Is that true? Dick and Glenda Robinson, is it number 60? Dick and Glenda's 60th wedding anniversary today. And Skeets and Marla, it's good to see you here, all the way from the mission field of Tennessee, back in the Holy Land. Good to have you here. Well, we do have a lot to be thankful for, don't we? Our health, our family, our church, our church family, community, and our salvation, what Jesus has done for us, which supersedes anything that's going on in this world, which gives us cause to thank the Lord no matter what kind of hell the enemy is throwing our way. We are to be thankful. With that said, it's been a tough week. As most of you know, Melvin Clark is up at the St. Francis off of Emerson and he's not doing well. We're praying that he um, recovers. But um, sometimes things happen in your life and you get an imprint. A couple of weeks ago when uh, I went into the Hope class and saw Brother Dick, there's an imprint. And I, uh, I'm glad you're here. I am so thankful you're here. I think Ray, Ray said it that afternoon uh, that I don't know what it would be like here at M1 without Dick Robinson and Glenda. This week, as I was in the hospital with Melvin, Monday and Tuesday, I had a chance to pray with him. And um, um, when I asked him if I could pray with him, he's like, yeah, absolutely. And then I began praying, and he began praying. Wednesday and Thursday, it was a little different. He was on life support. 
And the imprint you get of someone being on life support is something you can't just, you know, wipe the dry erase board out of your mind. That imprint is there. And so it's been tough. The Clarks mean an awful lot to M1. I've had several people contact me and ask how he's doing and uh, expressed how much that Melvin and Patty, and not just their food pantry ministry, but their testimony, how much their testimony means to them. They, they are part of M1, and I'm not sure I can, I'm not sure I want to think of M1 without Melvin or Patty. It's kind of like thinking of M1 without Bob Cordell. It's just not the same, but they'll always be part. Uh, in fact, from the early days, I'm going to reminisce. I'm an old guy, so I get the opportunity to reminisce. I remember at the old Walnut and Graham church, I remember the, the musty smell of the basement. I remember how rough the, the steps were in front, and if you got your polyester pants snagged on them, it would make a hole. Because kids play in their polyester pants. I remember... I don't know when it was, but I remember these pews were in the sanctuary. And I always like to look underneath and see how many gum uh, things had been stuck under there. <laughs> I don't get it, but um, I remember one time looking behind us, and the Clarks were back there. And Teresa, who's the same age as I am, their daughter, she had this... Uh, bag, this clear see-through bag, a Ziploc or whatever, and it was full of farm animal toys. And I just could not take my eyes off of that bag. I thought little toys like that came in a box. <laughs> but she had them. And she got down and she began playing with those toys. And I was over the pew just watching. And Patty looked at me and said, come on back. And I looked at Mom and she goes, go ahead. So I crawled under the pew <laughs> and went back and played with those farm animal toys from the Clarks. As I was in the hospital this week, one of the things I prayed for for Melvin was a miracle. And I've encouraged people to do miracle healing prayer. If you want to pray for Melvin this week or anyone else here in the sanctuary, it'll be open during the day. You can come in any time and pray. But that image, life support. Melvin's situation made me think about scenes in Scripture where Jesus went and he healed people. In Mark chapter 1, that's where we're going to begin. Scripture records how much healing Jesus really did. Last week in my message on uh, demons and zombies and vampires and mummies, uh, we spoke about what happened in Mark chapter 1 where Jesus was in a service in the synagogue. He was preaching and a man was demon possessed in his very presence. But he cast that demon out. The demon knew who Jesus was. What do you want to do with us, Jesus? We know you're the son of God. And he said, be quiet. Zip it. And he cast him out without doing any physical harm to the man. Can you imagine how the rest of that service went? <laughs> As we go on, I want to just look at some scenes. And I don't have a long message. But at the end of this service, I do want to pray. I'm going to ask you as a congregation, we're going to pray. Because I still believe Jesus can heal. Hebrews 13.8. He's the same yesterday, today, and so what we're about to read, that same Jesus can do the same today. Right after that service, we look at Mark, it, if you can take me down just a little bit. In Mark chapter 1, verse 29, this is right after he cast the demon out of the man who was in the service with him. As soon as they left the synagogue, they went with James and John to the home of Simon and Andrew, okay, which is Capernaum. And uh, 
some people just don't think about it, but Jesus, uh, Capernaum was sort of his home base for ministry. In his three-year public ministry, they always came back to Capernaum. And so they went uh, after this service where Jesus cast out a, a, a demon from a man who was in the service. He went home. They went to have lunch. And so verse 30, Simon, who was Peter, Peter's mother-in-law was in bed with a fever. And they immediately told Jesus about her. And so he went to her. Say that with me. He went to her. One more time. He went to her. He took her hand, helped her up. The fever left her and she began to wait on them. An instant healing. Instantly. Jesus went to people and he healed them. We continue. That evening after sunset, the people brought uh, to Jesus all the sick and demon possessed. All. If you want to underline that in your Bible. The whole town gathered at the door. Verse 34. And Jesus healed many. What did we just say? We said they brought to Jesus all the sick and demon possessed. All. Verse 34, Jesus healed many. Not all. Right? Or am I misreading it? He healed many who had various diseases. He also drove out many demons, but he would not let the demons speak because they knew who he was. People brought other people to Jesus and he healed them. Continuing on, verse 35, very early in the morning while it was still dark, Jesus got up, left the house, and went off to a solitary place where he prayed. The key to healing is prayer. Can I get an amen? Not Sunday morning prayer, but prayer when you get alone in your solitary place, just you and the Almighty. He can soul search you but also you can bear your soul to Him. Jesus went and prayed. (laughs) But people are always wanting Him. Wanting Him. Simon and his companions went to look for Jesus. And when they found Him, they they exclaimed, everyone's looking for you. Well, we live in a world where a lot of people are looking for Jesus. And maybe they don't know it's Jesus, but they're looking for something. Something to help us for such a time as this. When there's uncertainty in the direction of our country. When uh, there's uh, inflation. And some say we're going back to the 70s. And some remember gas lines and prices. And just the uncertainty. People are looking for something. And I believe they're looking for Jesus. I, I believe they're looking for Christians to stand up and say, I know Jesus. And I have certainty that he's still in control of everything. He is still able to do more than we could ever ask, hope, or imagine. According to the riches we have in Christ Jesus. Well, they came and Jesus, they told Jesus, everyone's looking for you. Verse 38, Jesus replied, well, let us go somewhere else to the nearby villages so I can preach there also. That's why I've come. To what? Heal? To do miracles? He's come to share the good news. So he traveled throughout Galilee, preaching in their synagogues and driving out demons. And notice this, a man with leprosy came to him and begged him on his knees, If you're willing, you can make me clean. Mm. Verse 41. Jesus was what? Indignant? Is that the right interpretation? Indignant? If you are indignant, what does that mean to you? Upset. There is a debate over the interpretation of this word. Some believe the the interpretation indignant is correct. That Jesus was a little upset by this this man with leprosy uh, coming to him. Um...
You may say, well, but Jesus, he came to heal, to preach. and mm -hmm. But he's all God. He's also all man. Right? And he's been tempted in every way as we are, and yet he was without sin. Some say that the word indignant should be uh, interpreted, he had pity on him. Or he had compassion upon him. But some believe indignant is the correct word. Because as a rabbi, if Jesus were touched by a man with leprosy, and by the way, if you had leprosy, you were supposed to be quarantined. And we all know what it's like to be quarantined, don't we? It's a joyful experience, right? No? No? If someone mandates that you're quarantined, do you enjoy it? I think that's a good uh, use of the word indignant. I want people to tell me what to do with my body. The leper was out in public. And as a rabbi, if the leper came up and touched Jesus, he would be considered clean. And in order to, to get the status back as clean, Jesus would have to go into quarantine, a process that would last at least a week. And you may say, well, he was Jesus. He was still a rabbi. And he didn't come to abolish the law. He came to fulfill the law. And so, Jesus, as a man may have experienced feelings maybe some of us have today <laughs> when businesses are being mandated to enforce a quarantine or to let people go. We know what it's like to be indignant or upset or disappointed or even angry. And it's okay that Jesus was indignant. Not that he didn't love the man, not that we know what he's about to do, but he experienced the fullness of humanity. He knows what you're feeling when you get angry or you get upset or you're not sure about everything that's coming our way. It's okay. And so this term, Jesus was indignant, I'm going to go with that. He's kind of upset. But he did have compassion on the man. He did have pity on the man. The man said, if you will, if you're willing, I know that you can heal me. I know that you can do for me what I can't do for myself. And so, Jesus reached out his hand and he touched the man. I am willing. Be clean. And immediately, the leprosy left him and he was cleansed. Now if Jesus could do that then with leprosy, can he do that today with COVID? Absolutely. And so the question is, why doesn't he? Well, that's a good question. We expect him to heal all. But sometimes he just heals many, not all. Sometimes... He has his way. All the time he has his way. And sometimes his way is not our way. And there's a clash. And we don't understand. We get upset at him when actually maybe it has something to do with us. Because look what happens with this man. Jesus sent him away at once with a strong warning. Okay, listen to the instructions of Jesus and what this man does instead. A strong warning. See that you don't tell any, this to anyone, but... Follow the, the law, the procedure that's in place. Go show yourself to the priests and offer sacrifices that Moses commanded for your cleansing as a testimony to them. Finish the quarantine. Obey what society uh, expects. Okay? What did the man do? Did he follow what God wanted him to do? Did he obey the words of Jesus? Instead, he went out and he began talk, to talk freely, spreading the news. Is that obedience? Mm. No. No. 
He knew exactly what Jesus said. He knew exactly what God expected of him, and yet he did it his way. And there are consequences when we take matters into our own hands. Amen? Yeah. As a result, Jesus could no longer enter a town openly. Wow. Because the, this man who had a miracle happen to him, he took the matter into his own hands. He became an obstacle for others to receive Jesus. He became a barrier between Jesus and other people. Wow. Maybe sometimes God touches our lives, healing, doing a miracle, or answering prayers, and we want Him to do it again, but we don't do exactly what He asks us to do. We take the matter into our own hands. We know better. We're thankful. We're grateful. We want to praise Him. But sometimes He wants us to be quiet. Sometimes He just simply wants us to do what He asks us to do. And that's what He asks this man to do. There will always be obstacles between God and man. Sometimes it's illness, disease, reason, excuses, the situation. Sometimes it's because we take things into our own hands when all we should have done is do exactly what God asks us to do. As we follow Jesus into Mark chapter 2, a few days later when Jesus again entered Capernaum, okay, the people heard that he had come home. Again, he used Capernaum as his home base in ministry. They gathered in such large numbers that there was no room left, not even outside the door, and he preached the word to them. Some men came, bringing to Jesus a paralyzed man carried by four men. Since they could not get to Jesus because of the crowd, they made an opening in the roof above Jesus by digging through it. <laughs> they lowered the man on the mat. When Jesus saw their faith, not the faith of the paralyzed man, when Jesus saw the faith of the four men that brought this man to him, when Jesus saw their faith, then he said to the paralyzed man, Son, your sons are forgiven. But he's paralyzed. Your sins are forgiven. Jesus, he's paralyzed. Your sins are forgiven. To Jesus, which is more important? Some of the teachers of the law were sitting there thinking to themselves, why does this fellow talk like that? He's blaspheming. For who can forgive sins but God alone? Jesus immediately knew in his spirit that this is what they were thinking in their hearts. Our thoughts, our words are transparent to God. When we get indignant, when we get angry and upset, when we're confused and we don't know why things are happening the way they are. Sometimes we question that he really has control of the situation. Jesus knows. He knew what the religious people were thinking when he said to this paralyzed man, your sins are forgiven. And so he uses it as, as a teaching point. He said to the Pharisees, the teachers of the law, the religious, why are you thinking these things? Which is easier, to say to this paralyzed man, your sins are forgiven, or to say, get up and take your mat and walk? Which is more important? I want you to know that the Son of Man has the authority on earth to forgive sins. So he said to the man, I tell you, get up, take your mat, and go home. <laughs> what did the paralyzed man do? He experienced a miracle. The limbs that were once paralyzed became functional again. Can you imagine being in the middle of that scene. <laughs> and he got his mat. He got up. He didn't go back out the roof. <laughs> no, this time he went out the front door. And everyone saw the miracle that Jesus did in this man's life. This amazed everyone and they praised God saying, we have never seen anything like this. What 
the miracle healing or Jesus saving someone from their sins? Which is more important? Yeah, miracles settle issues. Yeah, miracles answer questions. Yeah, miracles create and inspire faith. But if it always takes a miracle to have faith, if it takes, if a miracle supersedes salvation, which is more important? Over in Luke chapter 7, some don't need a miracle to have faith. In Luke chapter 7, Jesus had finished the Sermon on the Mount. Okay, the greatest sermon of all time. Blessed are. When he had finished, uh, verse 1, when Jesus had finished saying all this to the people who were listening, the sermon, the sermon on the Mount, he entered where? Okay. There, a centurion's servant. Now, who was a centurion? He was a military man. He was a seasoned military man. You don't become a centurion simple, by political appointment. You can have political influence, but most of the centurions of that time, they earned it. They were true soldiers. They, they had been under the command. They had experience. To be a centurion, you had to do it Rome's way. You had to know how to salute. You had to know how to play by the rules. This, this guy was a centurion. And everybody recognized him as probably the way we're going to vet, uh, uh, recognize our veterans next Sunday. We're going to honor them. And we're not going to forget them. This guy was a, a veteran, a centurion. Okay? There, when Jesus arrived at Capernaum, there was this centurion servant whom his master, master valued highly. He was sick and about to die. Maybe he had COVID. But he had something and he was on his deathbed. The centurion heard of Jesus and sent some elders of the Jews to Jesus asking him to come and heal his servant. How many times have we invited Jesus to go and heal someone? When they came to Jesus, they pleaded earnestly with him. This man, this centurion, this honored citizen of our society, this hero, this man deserves to have you do this because he loves our nation and he has built our synagogue. And so, Jesus went with them. He was not far from the house when the centurion sent friends to say to him, Lord, don't trouble yourself, for I do not deserve to have you come under my roof. That's why I did not even consider myself worthy to come to you. But say the word and my servant will be healed. The centurion mentioned his servant to Jesus. He spoke of him to Jesus. People are spoken of to Jesus. He goes on, For I myself am a man under authority with soldiers under me. I tell this one go and he goes. I tell that one come and he comes. I say to my servant do this and he does it. When Jesus heard this, he was amazed at him and turning to the crowd following him, he said, I tell you, I've not found such faith, great faith in Israel. The man went home. Then the men who had been sent returned to the house and found the servant well. The man just spoke the servant's name to Jesus and the servant was healed. Jesus, Jesus physically was not there. So, Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. I have... If you're looking at the sermon notes, we're about to finish. We've, from these passages, from this scripture, this is what we see about Jesus. Jesus healed. He healed people that he went to. He went to Simon's mother-in-law. 
Jesus healed people that came to him. The whole town showed up. Jesus healed people that were brought to him. The paralyzed man brought through the the roof. Jesus healed people that were spoken of. The centurion servant. If we really believe that Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever, then Jesus can heal. Amen? Jesus can heal. When He comes to people, sometimes He goes. Jesus can heal people that come to Him. When they intentionally make the effort to come to Him. Jesus can heal people that are brought. You know, there's a, there's a line on our Sunday school roster that, that it's just a simple little word, word called calls. Sunday school teachers, you know what I'm talking about? It took me a long time to figure out what calls are. It should be invitations. The number of people you've invited to Jesus. The number of people you've invited to come to a worship service. The number of people you've invited to come to Sunday school. The number of people you've invited to accept Christ into their heart as their personal Lord and Savior. Part of our responsibility as followers of Christ is to bring people to Jesus. Jesus can heal people that are brought to him. And also we learned this morning, Jesus can heal people that are spoken of. I know, I've seen the Lord heal people. I thank the Lord when when we sing, give thanks, or or, um, um, thank you, Lord, that that one line that said, you took my, uh, healed my disease and my pain. And I, I find myself going like this even when I'm by myself just going through the song. Thank you for, I don't have hip pain. He took care of it. Yeah, he gave people technology and uh, intellect to design artificial hips, but it's because of him. Thank you, Lord. And then I go back to that image of Melvin. In that hospital bed, they've got... I think they said 24 sensors on his scalp to monitor the brain activity. And so he had a bandage around those sensors. He had a breathing tube. And when I was there Friday morning, when I went and saw him, and and, uh, they were taking him off the cooling pad and beginning to start the process of reviving him. And I saw that he was, every once in a while, would have these little twitches. I said, hey, is he, is he waking up? And she goes, That's, those are little tremors or seizures. That's normal. And I said, so will he be awake this afternoon? And she kind of looked back at the monitor. And I said, will he, you know, how long will it take? And she said, you know, he may not wake up. So I have that image of Melvin. And then I go to Tuesday at St. Francis Mooresville and his laughing. You know Melvin. If you get into a conversation with Melvin, he, he never lacks in words. I think we all love Melvin. And we all know that he obviously loves God. And I was supposed to share this message with you today. I had planned on talking about veterans setting up next week's service, and it's going to be a very special service. 
But then the Lord checked me and said, hey, you've got that image of Melvin. Let me give you an image of Melvin. And it's an image where he's with all the apparatus and he's laying there with the little wrap around his head. No one's in the room. But then Jesus walks in. And he puts his hand on his head. And he says, my son. And Melvin's eyes open up. And he's awake. And he smiles. And he starts to talk. And Jesus goes, be quiet. <laughs> You're going to have time. And then Jesus heals him. He heals him. The way he heals him is up to him. I know how I want him to heal him. I want to see him right back there behind Kurt next Sunday. That's my choice. But I'm not the one who can heal. I'm not the one who gave my life so that he could have salvation, eternal life. And which is more important, the healing or the salvation? Jesus has Melvin. He's got it under control. But what we can do, we can mention Melvin's name to Jesus. We can bring others to Jesus. Maybe we need to come to Jesus and ask Him to intervene in our situation to help us process, you know, why, why do bad things happen to good people? You know, God, why don't you answer? I, I think I'm pure-hearted on this and wanting to see Melvin back here. But I don't want to be like the, the leper who went out and just started doing what he wanted. I don't want to take the matter into my own hands. I want to turn the matter over to him and let him handle it. So Jesus can heal people that he comes to I think he's going to come to Melbourne. I can just see him walking in that room, putting his hand on his head. The place glowing. People that come to him, people that are brought, and then people that are spoken of. All of us have people that we need to pray for. If you don't have anyone to pray for, get a bulletin and look at the prayer list. There's a unique situation. There's a need for every name on that list. We all have individual needs and concerns that we need to bring. And so we're going to finish up this service. It's just 12, 12 minutes after 11. We're going to sing a song that I think is a great altar call song, and it's also a heart check song. Spirit of the living God, fall fresh on me. We're going to sing that, and I'm going to have you stand. If you want to come and pray, the altars are open. Maybe you need to bring someone's name to Jesus. Maybe you want to bring Melvin's name. Maybe you want to bring a situation, your situation, to Jesus. The altars are open. But I do believe this. Jesus can heal anyone of anything at any time. So, let's stand. Hit that song. Spirit of the living God. Our precious Heavenly Father, we thank you for the opportunity we have to be here. Thank you for the illustration of your word. How Jesus is awesome. He's our Savior, our hero, our champion. But sometimes we just need encouraged. Sometimes we need to be inspired to see it your way. So help us, Lord. Come, Holy Spirit. If you want to pray, come pray. Spirit of the living God, fall fresh on me today.
today, right here, right now. Spirit of Lord, we need an outpouring of your Holy Spirit. We want you to move. You know those who have stepped out this morning, how they stepped out. Maybe they're bringing someone and they're mentioning their name to you and we know that you can go and do things that we can't even imagine. You can reveal yourself in a new way. You can do a miracle. Lord, we all lift up Melvin Clark to you, and Patty, and Susan, and Teresa, and Don, and Josh, the entire family. But we pray for a miracle for Melvin Clark. We pray that he'll come out of this coma. And maybe it's because we are selfish. I plead guilty. I love him. But we pray that you'll touch his body and heal him in the way you choose. And draw closer to Patty. She's trying to be so strong, and I know she just needs you. And thank you for our church family, where we can gather around one another during the valley of the shadow of death. You know the other situations that were brought, marriages, families, business, education, grandparents, husband and wife, decisions, choices, 
and even salvation. You know everything that's being brought and lifted to you right now. And we believe that you're such an awesome, mighty God that you can meet every need represented here this morning. So flood this place with your presence. Let your people hear your voice. We love you. We give you the praise, glory, and honor for who you are. And during this month of Thanksgiving, we're not going to leave you out. Because without you, there's nothing to be thankful for. There isn't. You're our creator. You're our life sustainer. You're the promise keeper. You're the way maker. We love you. We praise you. Father, help the service not to end now. But as we go our separate ways and we go out into the community where needs are represented and people are searching for something, help us through the opportunities you provide, help us to give you to, to others. In the great name of Jesus, we pray. If you love the Lord this morning, give him a wave offering. If you're going to be his example and his mouthpiece this week, give him a wave offering. Amen. Any testimonies? What a mighty God we serve. Amen. Have you been in his presence? Amen. Happy birthday. Happy birthday. <laughs> Okay. Amen. Well, Brian, cue it up. Goodness of God. I have the ability, and I'm going to exercise that right as pastor to choose goodness of God for us to sing right now. Amen? <laughs> All right, here we go. Let's sing it. And then we're going to go out and share his goodness.
with every breath that I am able. I will speak of the goodness of God. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. My life laid down, I surrender now. I give you everything. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. My life laid down, I surrender now, I give you everything. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. We don't deserve it, but he loves us. And all my life you have been faithful. All my life you have been so, so good With every breath that I am able I will sing of the goodness of my God He has been good, hasn't he? Give him a wave offering Oh, oh all my life you have been faithful Thank you, Lord. In all my life, you have been so, so good. With every breath that I am able, I will be of the goodness of God. I will be of the goodness of God. Amen. We serve a mighty God, and He is so good to us. Let's go out and share that goodness with someone who's looking for Him. God bless you. You are dismissed.